Good morning and welcome. You are tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. As always, I thank you so much for tuning in. We are back, second show back from a rather long hiatus. I was as I was preparing for this show. Um, I actually had a chance to sit down and, and kind of look to see how long it had been. Four months. That's a pretty good little vacation there. But we are back for the time being. I think we're going to stick with a one show per week format. I'm hoping to go back up to um, at some point to a two or three hour uh, show if we're going to stick with that one one show per week format. But we'll see how it goes. Today we're going to try to do an hour and a half. We're going to be talking a lot of things going on in the world. Obviously, we're going to touch upon the um, the rash of violence. I shouldn't say rash. We're a violent country, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. We are. We're going to talk about Dallas, uh, what happened, what transpired in Dallas last night. We'll talk about uh, the other police shootings that were caught on video uh, this past week, which sort of precipitated, maybe, um, maybe precipitated what, what happened last night. And then I sat down with Carlos Page last night. We did a little interview and we talked some NBA action and we talked about the Memphis Grizzlies. We talked about the Tennessee Titans. Very fun little chat with him. Always great to interact with him on, on social media. And it had been a very long ta- time since he and I had chatted. So I was happy to get to do that. I'm so tired, you guys. Uh, not just physically. I'm I'm physically tired. I haven't slept well this week because of all the events that we're getting ready to discuss. And so when when Carlos and I were chatting last night, I had a little bit of a faux pas. So um, I hope you'll forgive me for that and, and for any faux pas that happened during the course of this show, because, you know, I am tired and then we live in interesting times. It's, um, you know, Going into um, that interview, I was so tired. I wanted to take a nap, and um, I, that I, I knew I needed to prepare. And you know, taking a nap that sometimes that makes you even more tired or groggy than than you already are. So I didn't, and we got through the interview, and it, it was great, primarily because of him. And I was like, oh, I just hope that you know we don't have anything bad that happens because I really want to get some sleep. And then lo and behold, you know, uh, America being what it is, seemingly these days, we we had another incident that, um, you know, that that kept me up until rather early this morning. It was three o'clock before I laid down yesterday morning because of um, you know, the the police shooting that had happened a couple of days ago. And then this morning, it was probably around two o'clock before I laid down and so up early, and so I'm hoping that, you know, can can we please, please try to do better for, and I know I'm not the only one who, who's going through this, you know, can we please try to do better uh, for just a couple of days so that, you know, we can all recover a little bit from, from these events? Yeah, I, I don't have any answers to to what's going on in this country right now. I, just, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of thoughts about it. I think one of the more interesting things, and we're going to talk about the, the Dallas protest, which by all accounts was proceeding, operating, going very peacefully until this very concerted um, effort to disrupt and um, – cause uh you know cause more problems in this country went down it does sound like that they have caught a suspect uh, there was a lot of misinformation on social media last night and i got up this morning and i had to prepare for the show and so i haven't really had a chance to to really look in any great detail about uh, the suspect that it, he was killed during the police standoff he has been identified. I don't know anything about him just yet, but um, you know there was a lot of misinformation on social media. But you know it was it was interesting watching it going down on social media last night because of um, a lot of the commentary. You know that that um, or you know that typically 
typically is the word I'm looking for, typically accompanies these types of, of events. And one of the more concerning and I think noteworthy things to to come out of that was a comment by one of our our former congressmen, Joe Walsh, who um, felt very comfortable in a public venue on social media on Twitter, threatening our current sitting president Barack Obama and a rather large proportion of our citizenship because of the killing of the Dallas police officers. And uh, the last count that I saw, five police officers dead as a result of the shootings at the uh, peaceful protest. Um, this uh, This was not a violent event. It was made violent by the actions of outside people who want to you either want to be famous or they want to cause cause problems. And either way, um, I, I think unfortunately their goal is going to be accomplished. This this was not part of the peaceful protest. Let's get that straight. This was not part of the peaceful protest. This was this this was outside people looking to cause problems. And I said. Before I lay down and tried to get some sleep, I said, you know, it it seems to me that there are forces within this country that are operating to try to divide us, to try to make us hate one another, to try to, um, to, to try to separate us, to try to weaken us. And that's how, you know, divide and conquer is a very real thing. It's very effective. In any organization, in in, in any um, uh, arena where you have, you know, a group of diverse people trying to coexist, and that can, you know, that can be um, a, a rather large number of things. When you have that um, that coalition trying to, um, you're trying to operate, divide and conquer is a very common and very effective technique to take down uh, that that group or that organization. And it happens to countries too. And yeah, I'm very concerned about what's going on in this country and how we how we view one another, how we're interacting with one another. And we've got to do better. If we don't, I really am concerned about you know what's going to happen. But Joe Walsh felt that a former congressman felt it was okay for him to threaten our current sitting president, Barack Obama, to threaten a large proportion uh, of our... Now, he deleted the tweet, but, you know, the Internet being what it is, nothing goes away. You know, you're, you can... You can try to you, know, you can try to delete that stuff, but it doesn't go away. And yeah, I think that that speaks volumes to where we are as a country. We have a hate monger who's running for president, who's very popular among a large proportion of of our citizenship. And I think that says you know that speaks volumes too as to you know where we are as a country and you know, what, what our um, priorities are. But we are watching that, watching that happen and watching some of the commentary and some of the people who, you know, you're always going to disagree, you know, with, with, um, with one another and how you disagree, I think says a lot about, you know, about who you are, but, Watching how people were um, commenting on uh, on the latest tragedy was very interesting, and uh, I don't know. I just think that um, if we're honest with one another, we're at a very crucial point in in this country when we're talking about our uh, personal relationship. You know, with one another and what that means for for this country's stability 
what it means for the stability of our government. Um, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, it is, it is rather interesting. There was um, a photo, <coughs> excuse me, there was a photo that was being circulated of a, a possible suspect. And I, when, when I first saw that, I was like, I don't know about this. You know, it was a man <coughs> who was walking through the crowd. He had, a, I'm not, I own a gun, but I'm not all that versed on guns. It was a very big gun. And, you know, it was slung over his shoulders. It turns out it wasn't loaded. And he was just exercising his right to open carry in Texas as the law permits. But his photo was being circulated on social media as a suspect, possible suspect, person of interest. They tried to say, you know, they tried to, to say person of interest. And as it turns out, he was not. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't even involved at all. When I saw that, I was like, this does not, I don't think so. This doesn't make any sense. Um, this, you know, because from the information that we were getting, it did look like this was a planned Thing and was being executed by, um, you know, it was a, a sniper attack. And, you know, as it turns out, it, it wasn't him. And, you know, he's rather fortunate that he is alive. And there was, a, at one, one thing that I did do when I got up this morning was I saw a video of him and I watched it. And it was very interesting. You know, by all accounts, the, the Dallas Police Department is, is very good and very well respected. And they appeared to do things the right way. And they, were inter, they interacted with the protesters in an appropriate manner. And they were, by all accounts, extremely courageous and, you know, put their lives, these police officers put their lives on the line to protect these protesters. And uh, for that, you know, they're heroes. They, um, you know, that, that part of what happened was, was, you know, noteworthy and, and worthy of respect. But as I was watching this video and this man is talking about how the police are lying to him and, you know, giving him, telling him false information, information that he knows to be false because he didn't, he wasn't doing the things that the police were saying. You know, they said they had him on videotape shooting and all of this stuff. And, you know, it, it really bothered me. I mean, is that the way we want our police department? There's a reason why the citizenship doesn't trust the police department. And when you have the police who are openly lying to, um, you know, to, to people that they're interacting with, that doesn't foster uh, an attitude of trust. It doesn't foster a good relationship. And, you know, it was really concerning to me that, you know, this guy, is, he's coming out, he's saying, and they're just lying to me. I know they're lying because I wasn't doing any of the things, you know, they're telling him he's caught on video doing all of this stuff. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's I mean, clearly we've got to do something about the the issues that we're having with our police departments. Now, there are good cops out there. Uh, this is not... I'm not sitting here saying that every single cop is bad and corrupt and lying and 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 all and is out to you know shoot a black male on sight, but I think that we've got enough evidence to to believe that we've got an issue that needs to be addressed, and we've got to address it. We 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 have to fix that because when the citizenship doesn't trust the people who are supposed to serve and protect them, you've got a very real problem. You've got a very real problem, and it's a problem that has to, it just has to be addressed, or you're going to run into, you know, even even greater problems. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, we live in, we live in very interesting times, and, Something has to be done. We have to foster uh, a more cooperative, a more, um, 
empathetic and understanding environment in which we can coexist or, you know, we're going to be. And and I'll have to say something about the media. There was, was another thing that I did see, and I think that it was the New York Post that had a cover on its a morning edition that that in very large letters said civil war and was showing in with a picture of of you know what was going on in in Dallas last night that is so irresponsible our media is so irresponsible these days that i just can't even media you have to do better you're part of the problem you are part of the problem. You are part of what is creating this environment in which there's an attitude of distress, in which there's an attitude of hate, in which there's an attitude of a lack of understanding, a lack of empathy. You're part of the problem, and you have to do better. If you don't do better, you're going to be as responsible as anyone for taking this country down. And, you know, shame on, shame on them for doing that. That is, that's awful. So I had to get that off my chest. We're going to talk a little bit about um, this UT Law to uh, the University of Tennessee. I'm an alumni, an alumni went to, to school at the University of Tennessee. There was a Title IX lawsuit that was just recently settled. There were eight or nine plaintiffs suing the university for Title IX violations. The settlement came down a couple of days ago, I think on Wednesday maybe, Tuesday or Wednesday, and um, the the terms, I'm not sure that I know completely all the terms, but I know um, – you know the the better part of them. Obviously, the plaintiffs got some money. Two point four eight million, I think, went to to the young women who were suing. There was a stipulation that the university would pay the attorneys' fees, which I imagine were rather significant. Uh, there was the money that was allocated to create some positions to make it easier, hopefully more effective for possible uh, assault victims, rape victims to come forward and and operate in an environment that that is um, better than than what was alleged in the lawsuit. And then uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up, there's a very interesting article from John Solomon, CBS Sports, talking about one of the, the terms of, of the settlement. Oh, I should mention this. To me, the, more in, the, the best part of the settlement was UT's uh, agreement to turn their process over to an independent and outside review to make sure that it's operating in a manner that allows justice for the victims, for the alleged victims. And I think, to me, that's the most significant part of of the lawsuit. But <clears throat> this article by John Solomon was talking about another aspect of it, and that was that UT was no longer going to um, to funnel, <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, to funnel their athletes to a select group of of attorneys who were uh, former students at the university who were boosters who get perks and and other things from the university and <clears throat> it was this this article was you know sort of uh, complimentary and, and laudatory toward that aspect of it and you know I hope that it, that's true I hope that. UT's agreement not to do that does make a difference, but I don't think that it does. And and here's why. First and foremost, these athletes know which attorneys to go to. The university doesn't have to funnel them. They know. They talk to one another. Um, they read the newspapers. They read the message boards. They know which attorneys. They're, I mean, a lot of them know these attorneys personally. They don't have to have the university funnel them. 
they already know who they are. And so, you know, to me, it's just, there's nothing, it doesn't change anything. Um, I mean, you see that this is not just a college thing, um, you know, it, locally in Nashville. The Titans players know who to go to. They know which attorneys to get. Um, this, I mean, you know, these guys aren't stupid. They know who to go to. And if they don't know, they'll call a buddy who's been in trouble with the law before and say, hey, who should I go to? You know, or their agents will. So, you know, and I know cops college athletes aren't supposed to have, you know, that kind of representation. Um, to me, it would be far more effective for attorneys to who aren't the ones who help these athletes at a reduced cost or at no cost, pro bono. To me, it would be far more effective to have a group of attorneys willing to help the victims willing to come forward and offer their service and their knowledge and their protection to the women who, who need it really far more than the, the athletes have all kinds of protection. They have all the protection in the world because there are so many people willing to come forward and believe these guys and protect these guys and, and harass the, the victims who, you know, who don't have that kind of support. It's the victims who need the support. So to me, it would be far more effective to have a group of attorneys who are willing to help them, who are willing to to support and advise and and help the alleged victims. They need it. You know, there's there's no way you can get through this process without one. It, there's just not. And um, to me, that would be the far more effective thing to, is, is to have that. I don't know if, you know, if we'll ever get there, but hopefully, you know, hopefully we will. But I just, you know, that was interesting to me, and, and I wanted to, you know, to talk a little bit about that. You know, kudos to, 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 to the University of Tennessee for, um, you know, for their um, – their foresight in in settling that it was not going to this is a big season upcoming for the university for the football program the Tennessee volunteer football program is from all appearances on the upswing and so it's a big season for them going into the the upcoming season with that hanging over the university's head would have been a, a bad choice. Would have been a bad decision. So it was, it was, it was good that you know that they did that. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done across the country. We're still seeing fallout from Baylor, Baylor University. Um, I'm very interested to see what happens with with them. Um, was going to talk to Carlos about um, you know their losing some recruits they're they're having guys are leaving um is that you know partly because of you know the the title nine issues and and what could be coming down the pipeline for Baylor I don't know we're going to talk we'll talk about that in the upcoming weeks Carlos and I didn't get a chance to really um discuss it there's so much NBA talk so much NBA action that we were we're rather focused on that. And it is very interesting what's going on in, in college sports, college, you know, college football with um, Title IX, with sexual violence, rape, sexual assault. Um, it's always going to be, hopefully, not always, but at least for right now, it's, it's, it's a um, very big topic, a very interesting topic. Another interesting thing that um, that came down the pipeline this week: Gretchen Carlson suing Fox News and its head for sexual harassment. If you haven't had a chance to to read um, the details, some of the details of the lawsuit, it, it it is very interesting. And you know, it's I, I was reading it and I was like, you know, 
this is what women go through. Um, you know, that they're sexualized and uh, forced to, um, you know, forced to deal with sexual advances. And this happens in, I, I would venture to say it happens in, in virtually every single profession. Um, that women are, are are sexualized and forced to uh, walk a, a, a tightrope between being friendly and um, you know uh, you know not pissing off the powers that be, yet not encouraging you know that that type of behavior um, because it's hard you know when. When someone is making, you know, sexually suggestive comments about you, uh, propositioning you, you, and then someone in a position of power, you know, if you piss them off, it's going to go badly for you, and so it's very much a tightrope that that women have to traverse to keep their job. Um, and stay in the good graces of, of, of these, and this, you know, the, usually it's men, uh, um, equality being what it is, you know, there are certainly women who obtain positions of power and, and abuse it. We've seen that with, um, you know, in, in, in recent news with teachers and, and the, the allegations of, of sexual relationships with, you know, with their students, but it's, you, you, it, it's almost hard to describe how hard it is to, um, you know, to, um, to navigate those waters between, you know, we all want to, to look good and to, to, to be and feel, you know, a certain level of, of attractive in, in, in our professional demeanor yet, you know, it, you, you don't want to be too much because it does, it invites, you know, that kind of, and it's not always, you mean, you don't even have to, to dress in a suggestive manner to, you know, to get that kind of attention. It, It does seem to, um, to go part and parcel with, with, you know, being, with being a woman, but it was, it's interesting. And I encourage you to read that. I can't wait to see how it, according to CNN, after she filed her lawsuit, um, 10 more women came forward with similar allegations. Now, no one has joined the lawsuit. No, no one has filed um, a lawsuit of their own. It does look like at least at this point, they're just going to be witnesses for her. We'll see what happens with that. I want to touch upon the Los Angeles Rams, their reality television show. They're going to be on Hard Docs, the infamous um, HBO reality show that goes part and parcel with the National Football League. Um, but they're also going to have, I think it's an E! Online. There's another reality TV show that the Rams and some of their, their players are going to be associated with outside of, of hard knocks. And I saw that news and I was like, huh, well, that's very interesting because as you might recall, the NFL and the Los Angeles Rams were not very um, welcoming of Michael Sam and his, um, potential reality television show on the Oprah network. And I mean, we all know that the NFL and these NFL teams like to control content access and message, but how hypocritical is that? I mean, Mike Sam can't do his, but they're free to do, you know, it wasn't about a reality TV show. It was about them not being able to control it. And not being able to control the message. And that's, you know, I said that at the time and, um, you know, that, that has, um, you know, that has continued to, um, you know, to be the case. We'll go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, we'll 
go ahead and move into some sports talk. My interview with Carlos Page from the Sportaholic Radio Show. So stay tuned in. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. All right, welcome back. As promised, I'm joined now by Carlos Page. He is a local sports guy, been on the radio. He uh, he does it all. He's like, you know, a multi-sport uh, person like me. It's always a pleasure to interact with him on Twitter. I think this is the first time we've had an opportunity to sit down and chat uh, via well, no, I think that we have done this once before. I'd almost forgotten. But anyway, thanks so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Sharana, my pleasure. Glad to finally get in a session with you. And I know. Uh, We've been talking about this. Yeah, so it's good that we finally was able to make it happen, and my pleasure to do so. Yeah. Well, there's a lot going on. We're going to go ahead and, and dive into it. But before we do, tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Um, give a plug to your uh, radio show and you know, some of the things that you do and that you cover. Absolutely. Well, again, my name is Carlos Page. I host the Sportaholic Radio Show. Uh, you can hear that each and every Wednesday from 6 to 8 on 107.1 and 103.7. Uh, I do production work for CBS Sports Radio Nashville. I cover the Titans, the Grizzlies, University of Tennessee, pretty much anything that's local. Uh, hopefully I will be there. You'll see my face. So just a lot of local things. i got the website going at sportaholic.com. Yeah. So we're all over the place, just having fun and love talking sports and uh, you, right up my alley with what you do as well. Yeah, yeah, we're we're very similar, I think, in our pursuits, and um, it's been a very busy free agency um, in the NBA and the NHL. Do you do any pride stuff? Do you cover any hockey? I do a little bit, not as much as I would do NBA, but I know a little thing or two about the NHL as well, so... It's good to see that we were able to pull a free agent or two here and there. Oh, yeah. So that's yeah. good news. You'll have to come back. We'll have to talk some hockey. We probably don't have any time today because I do want to focus on the NBA. Some of the – it's been so wild and exciting. NBA Twitter has been very interesting the past <laughs> – it's always interesting, but it's been very interesting the past couple of weeks. We're going to talk about Kevin Durant and Dwayne Wade. What's next for the Grizz? Uh, some Titans talk. Then we'll take a quick break and uh, very quick, like, Seconds quick, and then we're going to finish up. We'll talk. We're going to talk about the intersectionality between sports and politics and uh, and social issues. So let's go ahead and get started. NBA free agency has been. It's always wild, and then it's not wilder this year. Uh, it's probably. Would you say it's on course with the free agency wild times that we've had with with like LeBron and some of the other names. Oh, yeah. I, I'll take this step further. I think this has been the wildest yeah. free agent period that we've ever seen. I mean, you got yeah. superstars moving left and right. Mm-hmm. Guys like, of course, Kevin Durant moving right. to the Warriors, Derrick Rose moving, mm-hmm. and, uh, Dwayne Wade. We're talking about MVPs, guys that's got championships mm-hmm. that's making moves like that. So this has probably mm-hmm. been the wildest cruises period I've ever seen in NBA free agent. Yeah, see, that was my impression as well. But, you know, LeBron gets so much attention that you you almost hate to, um, you know, to make that comparison. But I agree. I think it has been, it's been very wild. A while. And I didn't mention Jarek Rose. I want to ask you about him, too, as well, and whether you think he can stay healthy and all that. But let's start with the – let's start with – well, first of all, let's do this. Give us a rundown, in your opinion, of – the, those are the big three, but so what are some of the other more significant moves? Uh, what teams have done things that you liked and, and those kinds of things? Well, a, a team that's, of course, that, they're making moves, but it's in a smaller market. And they're not getting as much as exposure as the other teams. as the Indiana Pacers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Picking up Jeff Teague from the Atlanta mm-hmm. Hawks solidifies their point guard position. You bring in a Thaddeus Young, a guy that was uh, very productive in his time at Brooklyn, and they've made some other moves. Also bringing in Al Jefferson as well to solidify that bench. I mean, you're talking about a team that went from a barely contending to play playoff spot to a team that could be a top four 
team in the Eastern Conference next year. So that's the team that's really uh, under the radar, but they've made some surprisingly pretty solid moves going forward. Uh, another team is the Utah Jazz, uh, another smaller market team that we don't get to talk about a lot, but bringing in Joe Johnson uh, from the Miami Heat and a couple of upland moves where they landed a few other uh veteran free agents and you talk about another team that was fringe playoff team so the important thing about free agency is you, you know what the big teams you know the the, the, the big stars are going to do but those under the radar finding you know guys that you don't think about it then you watch mm-hmm. next season they end up contributing a lot more than what you thought yeah it, i agree i think um you know the, those it, you know the the big names get the big splashes, and obviously, um, you know, the teams we're getting ready to talk about are big players and, and have been successful, and uh, we'll see how, how these new acquisitions go. But well, teams who build solid, solidly, and of course, I'm a Spurs fan, and so that's kind of the, the mentality that I have. You know, the, the Spurs have been so good at just picking up, um, you know, good solid players, not necessarily superstars, but people that you know fit into their system that they can, and they make some moves too. Yeah, yeah, they have. Bringing in Gasol, that's 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 yeah. a big name for them because, like you said, mm-hmm. they normally don't go out the guys. But Gasol, we, we've been talking about this for years, maybe the last three years. He would be perfect in the offense that Popovich runs because he yes, likes to he run. Would. Mm-hmm. running his plays through his big man, and we know how well Casal can pass the ball. Yeah. So it's yeah. a really good fit. It's another one of those under-the-radar things that you're going to look up next mm-hmm. year, and you're going to be like, you know what, that was a very good pickup by the Spurs. Yeah, it was. I, although, you know, sentimentally, I do think that it spells the end. We'll see. Tim, I, I said that Tim Duncan retired. It does look like he probably will. I don't guess he's officially done that. What do you think that he's going to do? I think it's, at this point, all signs indicate that it, lo- it looks like he's going to hang him up. I mean, yeah. he doesn't have anything else to prove at this point. He you know, it's, He's won MVP. He's won ring. So, you know, and, and he really wasn't even playing a lot towards the end he of the season. He wasn't. He so wasn't. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, hey, Tim, if you want to come back one more year, of course, you know, the Spurs will take mm-hmm. him. But at the same time, if he walks away from the game, I think he has no regrets at this point. Yeah. Yeah, although, you know, it's the NBA will never be the same for me when he does officially hang them up. But, yeah, um, I, I think all signs point to it, too, even though he hasn't made it official. Any other teams making moves that you'd like that um, aren't going to be the big three that we're getting ready to talk about? <laughs> A lot, you know. It's uh, like I said, it's been a crazy off season. I, I I like what the Charlotte Hornets were able to do. They lost some of their bigger name players, lost Jeremy Lin, lost Al Jefferson, but that's able to replace them with some comparable players. Jerry Jack has got to come in and fill that backup point guard role. And I just like the way that they're building their team. They seem to be, mm-hmm. like you said, they know what fits their system, and they're going after mm-hmm. those type of players. And when you talk about these smaller markets, they know that they're not going to attract, you know, the Kevin Durant mm-hmm. or Derrick Rose right. of the world. So yeah. you just have to make sure that you get guys that want to come to town and guys that's going to be productive. And I think that's what Charlotte is doing. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about the Grizz in a minute, but, but let's talk about the big names. And I want to start with Kevin Durant and, you know, leaving the Wizards and, and, and all the stuff that um, – uh, Wizards, There's all the stuff that um, you know went on, and he took so much heat for you know for what he did, and uh, of course he wasn't like Dwayne Wade spending the entirety of his NBA career with one team, but you know it still he was sort of identified with. And it's not the Wizard; it's Oklahoma City, right? That's yeah, <laughs> that's like crazy. I didn't get much sleep. So I didn't listen to you guys. And I said this. I'll say this. We're recording this on Thursday night. So um, I said I was going to go live live, but we're still kind of doing fake live because I'm doing this interview on Thursday night. But I didn't get any sleep last night, which would be Wednesday night, because of the situation. I'm going to ask Carlos about the the, re, the latest in in police shootings. It was very upsetting to me to to, to watch that. Um, to watch that video. Both of the latest videos are very hard. So you just have to forgive me. My brain's a little bit crazy tonight because I am so tired. But Oklahoma City is what I meant to say, and I said the Wizards and kind of crazy. So anyway, 
Uh, so Durant kind of, and, and you know, someone said on Twitter to me, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this too, that Ke- that Kevin Durant isn't a legend, what is not going to be a legend in Oklahoma City. Given what he's done there, how can he not be? Right, right. I totally agree. I mean, he's given his blood, sweat, and tears for the last what nine years to their yeah. franchise, and from the perspective that I look at it, these teams. No matter what the sport is, NFL, MLB, NBA, mm-hmm. when those franchises want to move on from a guy, they're going to move on from him, whether it means to cut him, mm-hmm. to trade him, or anything. And and what Kevin Durant has done, and Brian James to a to some degree as well, is they, they're taking mm-hmm. the power that they have as players and using that leverage mm-hmm. and using it for their own advantage. And you cannot knock a guy for doing that. And I wasn't one of the ones that hated the LeBron decision, I didn't like the way he went about it. Right, you know, right. That's, how, that's the way I was, yeah. Yeah, you know, if a guy yeah. wants to make a decision to leave this team, that is totally up to him. If we want to leave our places of regular employment, you know, no one's going to bash us for taking a job that pays a little bit more. So, or, for I, take, or, or for taking less and wanting to go somewhere where you can get a big award. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all about convenience and what makes you happy. I'm a big yeah. purveyor of what makes you happy. You do it, and you do it well. So yeah. with the Kevin Durant situation, of course, he's going to get a lot of backlash. A lot of fans are going to say he's not loyal on this and whatnot. But at the end of the day, if that man is happy and he's made a decision, even though I will say this, it is a bit of a shocking surprise because it does seem a little bit weak to go to a team that just won 73 games yeah. coming off an of NBA championship within the last couple of years. That's the only thing that I think people, the haters, are going to say. You know, he went to a team that's already a pretty decent team at this point, yeah. and they're going to go. So that part I get. But other than yeah. that, there's really no argument that we should have about Kevin Durant. Yeah, but you know that he wants to stack the deck. In his, I mean, we'd all be stacking the deck, right, if we could. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit I stack the deck in my favor, you know. I mean, you do whatever you can do to make yourself, you know, to put yourself in – the most successful, you know, position possible. And I don't know how anybody, you know, can can knock him for that. Do you think that was – was that, were they really serious about keeping him? It kind of seemed like it was a slow process for them. Yeah. I think that in his heart of hearts, it's just like uh, – I compare it to a relationship. Sometimes a relationship between, you know, uh, two partners – it, it, it grows and it grows and it grows, and then it gets to a point where one person may not feel the same about that person as the other. Yeah. And it just, you know, they just grow apart. And Kevin Durant has spent his formative years as an NBA player, NBA player in Oklahoma City, which, yeah. you know, is, isn't the biggest market. There's pretty much nothing else to do down there besides uh, to play basketball. So mm-hmm. I think that his relationship with Draymond Green has been highlighted, which I was surprised to know how deep – their relationship was, yeah. and they would have been talking the whole season. And mm-hmm. today's NBA, you know, I, I, I know I'm, I'm 30 years old, but I still remember watching, you know, the older older day NBA where guys were going at like Michael and Magic. Those guys would have never imagined, you know, going mm-hmm. and joining forces. But mm-hmm. in today's NBA, with the way that the AAU basketball is set up, the yeah. camps, it is completely yeah. different in the way that these players interact. Yeah. They know each other from yeah. 14 on up for the rest of their yeah. life. So it's not that same thing. But it takes for a generational thing. One generation yeah. just doesn't understand that. Mm-mm. And it's not their fault. They didn't grow up yeah. that way. So I don't knock them for thinking the way they think. And I also don't knock these younger kids for knowing that yeah. they have the chance to play with their friends. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand that. And the NFL is, is much the same. You know, um, in that there's much more of a, uh, you know, they, I mean, they call it the brotherhood, right? Much more of a fellowship there, and they they all know each other from the camps, and you know, and, but free agency has changed everything. You know, it's changed the game, and um, it's changed the way the way, and rightfully so, the way players think and operate, and you can't compare. You really can't compare um, the old NBA to the new NBA or the, really the old NFL to the new NFL because, you know, um, guys are are going to to exercise that freedom and they're going get, to get the money that, you know, the, well, I mean, the, you know, the Birds and the, the Jordans and, you know, Magic Johnson, I mean, they made their money, but still, um, you know, it, it's still different. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's just a different concept of thinking, which, you know, once again, I think it's a age gap differential type of thing because I played in AAU, and, and a lot of guys that I met, I still know, and it just develops a different camaraderie. So nothing wrong with either line of thinking. Uh, I do like the more competitive nature where guys don't like each other. It just makes for better entertainment as fans. It you does. know, guys don't like each other. But besides that, I, I totally understand where these guys are coming from. Yeah. And you still have players who genuinely don't like each other. You know, you still have that. Uh, some of it's manufactured, but you do still have that. Just, we don't have a whole lot of time, but just real briefly, can you give us a rundown? on how Kevin Durant um, got to where he is and how Dwayne Wade got to the Bulls. I mean, that's kind of the bigger one. And and Derek Rose, you know, making his move. Yeah, absolutely. I see Kevin Durant just noticing that maybe him and Russell Westbrook just doesn't work together. I mean, they, they've done this for years. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people say that, you know, hey, at the end of the day, Kevin Durant made the decision. And maybe I just don't like playing with Russell Westbrook. That doesn't mean he's not a great teammate. doesn't mean he's not a great player. But maybe our styles don't are not compatible to us winning the championship. And I think yeah. also that Russell Westbrook may have let him know, hey, you know, do what you're going to do, man, because I may not be back next year. Matter of fact, yeah. I'm pretty sure that I'm not. So, yeah. you know, you just got to take it from that standpoint. As far as yeah. the whole Dwayne Wade situation, that was really a curveball because everyone thought that it was just a, a game of chess that him and Pitt uh-huh. Riley and that Miami ownership were playing. And it's just a matter of time before they came to a deal. But at the end of the day, it seems like Miami took him for granted maybe one too many times. Exactly. Of course, exactly. And I, mm-hmm. For a guy not to be paid the highest paid player mm-hmm. on his team for 13 years and he's mm-hmm. led you to three championships, it's just ludicrous. There's just no way that yeah. should happen. Pitt Robinson should be ashamed of himself for allowing that to happen. And, and everybody want to knock the Lakers for what they did with Kobe, giving him that legacy deal basically mm-hmm. at the end of his, in his career. But the same has to be said. It has to be some type of loyalty in the sports if a guy is giving you everything that he's got and you can't budge off of an offer that you know that you have the money to do. So that this this a shameful process. Uh, for lack of a better word, it seemed like he went to bed and did not know that Dwayne Wade would actually leave, and that's what he They did. didn't expect, yeah. they they. You're right. I compl- I'm not the biggest Dwayne Wade fan in the world. In fact, probably quite the opposite. But I, I agree. You know, and I didn't realize, of course, I don't follow the NBA probably as closely as you do, but still, I didn't realize how many times he had given them a break in order to get players in there. And it certainly has benefited him. And, you know, he's got the championships and all of that. How do you like his move to the Bulls, though? Well, when you take away everything, all the, the reasons that he did it, I don't really care for it. I, uh, mm-hmm. As far as the players that they have, Rajon Rondo and Jimmy Butler, uh, those guys are going to have a hard time spacing the floor because those guys kind of play similarly. Uh, Ro- mm-hmm. uh, uh, Wade and Butler are two slashers. They like to get to the basket. And when you got slashers like that, you have to have another player on the floor that's capable of making guys pay if they want to mm-hmm. double team in the lane. And the Bulls currently constructed really don't have that type of player. Defensively, they're going to be good. Rondo is still a pretty good defensive player. Robin Lopez, their center that they traded for, he's a good defensive. We know how good Butler is defensively. Mm-hmm. So defensively, I don't think they're going, to, they're going to be a problem. But as far as scoring the ball, getting out of each other's way, this is going to be very interesting to see. Ray John Rondo is a guy that likes to jump the ball for 10 to 15 seconds of a 24-second shot clock. How is that going to work with a guy like Dwayne Wade, who is similar, doesn't dribble as mm-hmm. much, but – and then you got another guy in Butler that does the same. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out as far as the players that they have now. I don't care for that roster, but it still should be good enough maybe to lock up a seven or eight seed in the East mm-hmm. with all things being considered. Yeah, they're not going to win a championship there, though, do you think? Uh, it's going to be tough, yeah. No one's really come, going to be up to top Cleveland with that roster that they constructed at this point. I mean, they, they're going to have some good battles. They're going to compete for some things. But at the end of the day, the Cavaliers are just – uh, so much far ahead of any other they team. They really are. Fashion. Yeah, they they really are. I want to ask you about the Boston Celtics before we we get through. But Derrick Rose, give us give us your thoughts on Derrick Rose. Um, you know, I'm happy for him that he went to a team that seems to and embrace him, seems to want him. Uh, you know, the knees are just not the athleticism is just not there anymore. And yeah. The thing about that is when your game is based solely off of something like that, athleticism, mm-hmm. and it leaves. 
it's going to make it very hard for you to become anything more than that. He's never had a jump shot. He's a guy that mm-hmm. gets to the rim and gets most of his points and then relies on the jump shot when guys think he's going to do that. So that part has left his game. But I still think, you know, he can be a decent player. Is it too much to ask for him to be a 20-point scorer? Probably not. Uh, you know, you're looking at a guy maybe between 15 to 20 points a game. Anything to help that Knicks backcourt. They were absolutely atrocious last year from that point guard position. So even if Derrick Rose is 85%, 80% of his former self, that's a big upgrade from that backcourt mm-hmm. standpoint. So, And then you bring him Joe Kim Noah, that's another team that's mm-hmm. going to make the playoffs next year. Yeah. They play that up to their capabilities. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I like Noah. I, I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, before we leave the, the the Kevin Durant thing, I just want to say this. and uh, you know, I, I saw people out there on social media saying, that doesn't make any sense. He could have won a championship, you know, with the Thunder. And and the thing that I kept thinking was, you know, I've been hearing that for years now. I've been hearing that for exactly. you know for three or four years now, and they yeah. never did. Yeah. You know, I mean, and and at some point, you know, that it it does pass you by, and I, you know, it's just uh, that argument just you know kind of rings hollow with me. G- give us an update on the Grizz. Where are they? What do you? things going on with them? The Grizzlies did what they had to do. They signed Mike Conley to the biggest deal ever in NBA yeah. history, as crazy as it sounds. Boy, but... people hated that. <laughs> oh, yes. Everyone wants to come out the woods and talk about that deal. He's mm-hmm. not even an all-star. He doesn't uh-huh. an all-star team. Mm-hmm. But you got to look at it from this standpoint. Again, we're talking about smaller markets. Mm-hmm. They're not going to attract the LeBrons, the Kevin mm-hmm. Durants, you know, guys like that. So they have to keep their own. Mm-hmm. If that means signing him to a mega deal like they did, that money had to go somewhere. So yeah. you might as well. I like Mike Conley. It didn't bother me at all. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's a pillar of that community. He does everything that he can for Memphis. And just talking about it from a pure basketball perspective, that team does not go without Mike Conley. He is their no, biggest doesn't. threat on the perimeter. He yeah. sets up their offense. They yeah, need he, him. He greases that wheel. There's no question at all about that. Yeah. yeah. So you have to keep guys like that, that that are your own, that makes the difference on your team. Adding the Chandler Parsons definitely is going to help. And that may be the biggest free agent signing that Memphis has ever had. They've never made a splash for the most part in free agent. They had to draft their players or acquire them in trade. So mm-hmm. to actually go out and pluck a guy from free agency, even if he's not the most, you know, the best player that was out there, but being able to get somebody, and again, we go to floor spacing. You have to be able to space the floor. Parsons can do that. So as long as he's healthy, uh, did they overpay for him a little bit? Maybe. But, again, we're talking about Memphis. you got to overpay in some cities just to get well, going. Well, yeah, we're getting ready to talk some Titans, and, you know, they suffer from a, a, a similar predicament. You know, smaller market, um, a team that's been in transition. Let's go ahead and, and turn to the Titans, and let me get your thoughts on the coaching staff, the the – uh, removal of the interim tag from Mike Malarkey and uh, the coaching staff changes there, and we'll turn our attention to the draft and free agency after that. Well, my first thoughts about Malarkey and that coaching search, uh, it's pretty shameful the way that the Titans handled that. They brought in a couple of guys, but everyone from covering the team, everyone had the indication that they were going to keep Malarkey. It wasn't oh, yeah. really a big secret in the room. So. Yeah. To go out and, you know, you got the Rooney rule, you got to ha- at least look at a couple of minority candidates and then look at a few other guys. But um, it seemed like it was a status quo move. I didn't I didn't initially care for it. You're bringing in a guy that's coming off a pretty bad season. But the thing is the players seem to believe in him. And, and yeah. a lot has to be said. If your locker room believes in a the coach, then they will do everything in their power to make sure that guy doesn't get fired. And I yeah, get that sense yeah. from mm-hmm. – I get it from the types that those guys really like Malark. And Marcus Mariota mm-hmm. seems to love him. So you have to kind of go with that title. If the team likes mm-hmm. him, there's no point of breaking up the continuity because it's mm-hmm. very important, as we know in sports, you don't want to break up anything that you don't have to. So I understand it from that standpoint. Uh, but being all in honesty, I think they could have done a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, and and I heard the same thing. Um, it was Malarkey was the guy, and um, you know I didn't think that there was ever going to be any serious you know moves anywhere else. But you know, in all fairness, the the better guys got seemed to get scooped up before they you know the, that 
um, will operate it slowly. It moves slowly. <laughs> that yeah. wagon moves very slowly down the lane. And you know, Hugh Jackson would have been the only one, really, that um, you know, that I would have. And he seemed to be, you know, committed to the Browns early on and, and made that move. So, um, you know, when when you sit and look back at it, I, you know, I mean, they could have done a lot worse, in my opinion. And but I probably like Mike Markey a lot better than most people. Uh, what about what did you think about what they did in free agency? Do you think that it it fit their needs, or are they making better free agency moves under new general ma- manager John Robinson? I absolutely love everything that John Robinson has done for the Tennessee Titans. I think that his hire was even more significant than Mike Malarkey because mm-hmm. we all know that you know your coach is only as good as the players that he has. Mm-hmm. And everything that John Robinson has done so far has put everyone in the league on notice that the Titans are going to come, they're going to try to get better, and he's staying true to what they want. They they talk about this exotic Spanish mouth, and what they did is they improved the offensive line, they've improved the running game, of course, with DeMarco Murray and drafting Derrick Henry. Defensively, we all know how bad that secondary was. He addressed that. He's done everything and more that I think that we wanted to see out of our next GM. And I'm really excited to see him as he grows even further into that role, uh, see what he's able to do. He's brought that Patriots mindset to things where, you know, even drafting, I mean, trading that number one draft pick and acquire more players, I think that was, a, that was a brilliant move as well. So everything that he's done so up to this point, I pretty much agree with now. I really like that. Yeah, um, I was – Skeptical at first, but um, I thought the initial moves were very good, initial being this year's moves, and obviously they'll be years to come, at least, you know, one or two. Do you think the Titans will be sold? I don't. I think that for the most part they've, you know, they've stated so many different things that you never can believe what you read. (laughs) For the most part, we know they're working in this business, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. from all the sources that I've talked to, everyone that I know within the organization, it seems like they're on pretty solid footing. Now, they do need to get some ownership things figured out as far yeah. as how they're going to show who's the mm-hmm. controlling owner and those type of things. And that's what mm-hmm. makes the public think, that, hey, maybe something's mm-hmm. going on there. But to me, it seems to be more of one of those things where the yeah. patriarch of that family has passed. Yeah. It takes any family a long time to get things back under normalcy. And they just mm-hmm. happen to own an NFL franchise. So yeah. if you look at it from that perspective, it makes a lot more sense. There was a lot of turmoil, and it wasn't just um, with the Titans. You know, the the passing of the guard from from you know Bud Adams, who had his hands, his fingers in everything, to yeah. um, you know to his kid, to really have to kind of figure out. And I do think it's going to be uh, Amy Adams Strunk who's going to be the 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 primary person, and that's. In my opinion, I know this isn't popular, but I think that they're smart to let her. To kind of protect her a little bit and let her grow into that a little bit before she does become more comfortable and then better in public about it, you know? I mean, because yeah. you don't want her to, you know, you don't want to trot her out and her not be prepared. And I know people don't don't like that, but it, I, to me it's smart, and I think they're going about it the, the right way. And, you know, once uh, things settle down, I think people will be happy with the way that's going. Um we're going to take a, just a really quick break. When we come back, we're going to uh, finish up with some talk about um, sports and politics. I constantly get state to sports to run, and we're going to find out if Carlos gets the same thing. So stay tuned in. You're listening to Back Talk with Sharon. All right, welcome back. I'm, as um, you guys know, we're chatting with Carlos Page. We had a great discussion about the NBA, about the Titans. We're going to talk. We're going to mix it up with some some sports and social issues, sports and politics. Uh, our last show, we talked about the whole sports versus political thing, and um, we had Adam Barlow on. We had a great discussion about that. And you guys know, I think that it's very difficult 
not impossible to separate the two. I want to get Carlos's thoughts on that, though. Do you think that it is possible? And, of course, this comes out of that very excellent um, media column by Richard Dyche at Sports Illustrated. Did you have a chance to read that, by the way? I haven't had a chance to read it, but I love Richard's work. Yeah. Yeah, he does a good job. It was interesting. He asked some some media members whether um, they integrated political uh, commentary, political uh, ideals into their sports coverage, and Adam Schefter took a lot of heat because of his um, statement that he did not do that. And I said, you know, um, it's, it's very difficult to, and I don't think that we should. I think that um, it would it makes it would make sports kind of awful. What do you think about it? I'm with you on that. Uh, I'm, I'm all of the belief of, i got to say it this way, staying in your lane. Because yeah. when you do a little bit more than what is expected as far as your coverage go, and, I, and I've and say something that personally, you know, a lot of guys, they have their Twitter pages, and they may have a page where they're just doing it separate. You know, they may have the sports page, and they may have their own commentary because you have to separate the two. When people – See you talking about political things. They almost want to jump down your throat and say, "Hey, <laughs> that's not what you do. Why are you telling me this? I only follow you to get my sporting news." So mm-hmm. it, when you make it personal like that, it makes it hard for other people. To, they don't almost don't want to follow you when you start telling mm-hmm. your beliefs because everyone's not going to agree with your political views. Mm-hmm. It's just not the way that it was meant to be in the first place. So I do try to keep mine separate from the two, and I think that's the right way to do it. If you want to know about my personal life, then you can go to my, my personal page. If you want to know about my business and the work that I'm doing on this side, you go to that page. And I think that's the way that it has to be done, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I, I think we have to allow room for for people to do what's comfortable for them, you know. Um, and and I, got, yeah, you know, I get the same thing. But for me, um, it, it, it's integrated, and it's integrated in the way that, um, you know, you see, um, you know, other women, you are know, talking about uh, things like domestic violence and, and rape and, you know, violence against women. And, um, it, you have other, you know, sports personalities, sports media people who integrate their um, – you know, their commentary about, you know, police shootings and, and things of that nature. And you know, B- the Bomani Jones comes to mind because, you know, he's you know kind of one of the, the bigger names doing that. He does do sports. But he also, you know, talks about these, these other issues. And um, But, you know, if you don't want to do that, I think that's fine. You know, you, you shouldn't feel like you have to. Um, but you also shouldn't feel like you have to keep the two separate, in my opinion. Well, I, the only reason I say that for the most part is because I don't want people to get confused on my information. You know, I want them to know that I'm doing this and whatnot. But, you know, then again, sometimes I do have my situations. Like with the, you know, with the two recent shootings we just right. had, mm-hmm. it just goes without saying that something needs to be said. And I even did that on my regular page because in some situations they're so bad or so good that it just it doesn't – it crosses that line where – you're going to talk about it because everyone else is talking about it. You're going to have your own opinions. And being a black man in America, I know some of the disappropriate, you know, things that's happened to not only myself but my friends, my family, things like that. So mm-hmm. it's just part of it. You know, you, you have to mm-hmm. make the decision. Do you want that, you know, that, that to be known about you or do you want to keep it nice and simple and mm-hmm. just talk about what you talk about? But I don't like yeah. either person for doing it like you from your side. I see your, your Twitter comments and you're very – uh, outgoing and, 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 and to talk about any issue that you feel is necessary. And I commend you for that because it's hard for some people to even bring those situations up mm-hmm. knowing the platform that they have. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when you make the choice to do that, you know that you're going to get blowback and you know, and, and it was one of the reasons I resisted it in, in the beginning is because, you know, I knew that I was going to get blowback and I knew that, um People were not going to like that, but ultimately for me, and again, you know, I'm just speaking for myself and, uh, you know, for who I am and and where I come from and the things that I face, you know, in in, in my life. And it came down, and then, you know, for me, it was a Ray Rice video that did it for me. Um, That really is what was sort of moving, 
that way anyway. But, you know, when, when the Ray Rice video came out and you saw that and, you know, you saw the, um, you know, the the after effects of, of the the revelations there, you know, it was like, I can't not do this because I have to wake up every day and see myself, look at myself, wow. look at myself in the mirror and know that I have, you know, I have thoughts to, to share on this that, you know, I think are important. If you don't think that they're important, don't follow me and follow me, you know, wow. don't pay attention to me, but um, I can't not do it because it's that important, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, just like it was important for me to, you know, I was watching the events unfold last night with this latest shooting, the video, I and mean, it's not the latest shooting, because we know this has been going on, um, oh, yeah. you know, since the founding of America. We've had, um, why people have had uh, issues with um, their uh, fear of, of, you know, black Americans, particularly black males, and that's carried over into our police department, and our police departments are in serious need of an overhaul. So we've got to do something, in my opinion. But anyway, I was sitting there watching all that unfold, and, I, you know, I'm like, I can't be silent. I'm not going to be silent about this. I was worried about the woman who filmed that. You know, she was in police custody. I didn't know what was going on with her and, you know, and if you don't speak up and if you don't speak out, then it allows people to operate with impunity. It allows uh, people with power to um, to take advantage of those who don't have as much or don't have any. And um, so I think it's important to do that. But I mean, that's just, you know, for me. I agree with you. I mean, the thing about that is that, like you said, we – if you go silent and let this continue to happen, then what, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing's mm-hmm. going to change. So yeah. I'm with you from that standpoint. I just like to make make it known that, you know, how, like you said, you, you want to make it known about how you feel about certain situations. And, and it's just one of those things where we've seen it so many times, and it and it hurts. Every time yeah. that I see something yeah. like that happen, it's like one of my brothers. I wonder, you know, someone in my family, because I've been in similar situations. I've been in situations where I've got pulled over, and not knowing what to expect, yeah, you know, those type I of bet. things. And it's just something that we have to live with. You know, we yeah. have no choice as African Americans in this yeah. country that we have to live with something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not fair, but at the same time, we have a lot of freedoms that a lot of different people don't have in, in different parts of the world. So you take it with a grain of salt, but you just never think it will come to the day where people are getting shot and killed on a day to day basis. That's the part that hurts that much. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. I know that you've got to go, and I hope that you'll come back and we can talk about this stuff some more. And, um, you know, maybe we'll have, devote a little bit more time to it because I don't feel like we, you know, we really had enough time to talk about about this latest little statement. But before you get out of here, tell everybody once again where they can find you, where they can find your show, when they can listen to it. Absolutely. This has been a pleasure. I'd love to do it again with you, Sharon, and get in some deeper discussions. But make sure to check me out on Twitter at any time at Lowe's Page. That's at L-O-S-P-A-I-G-E. Also the same on Facebook and also Instagram. Make sure to check out the radio show each and every Wednesday, 6 to 8 p.m. on 103.7 and 107.1. And any time, you can hit me on WNSR, CBS Sports Radio, Nashville, doing some production work. So I'm all over the place. Make sure to keep up with me. You can check out the podcast on SoundCloud at Sportolic Radio Show. All right. We'll tweet all this stuff out to you. Thanks again, Carlos. Have a great evening. Thank you, Sharon. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, that was my chat with Carlos Page, uh, the Los Page on on social media on Twitter. Check out his Sportaholic Radio Show. Follow him on on Twitter. He is a great follow. He covers a lot of different sports. He's a great person to interact with. He always has some great insight. It was a pleasure to to chat with him. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to talk about the NBA and some of those other topics. We 
there's so much to cover. There's so much going on in the world. You just, you know, you have, you have to kind of, um, you know, fit everything in the, the conversation at the end was pretty interesting. Yeah. Cause I get, um, not so much anymore, I guess, because people know I'm not going to shut up about it, but you know, I used to, it used to be really, um, bad on, on social media, you know, stick to sports, Sharona, um, and, and a lot of, um, blowback and, um, uh, you know, uh, negativity toward me because, you know, I talk about a lot of these social issues and I'm very uh, vocal and supportive of victims and, and victims' rights and the rights of of women and how difficult, you know, we, we started this show talking about, uh, you know, some of these things, you know, victims' rights and not, not just women, but, you know, um, across the board. And, I used to get so much, you know, um, blowback because I wouldn't shut up about it. And, um, you know, it, the people who, who do that, the people who try to silence you, they're really telling you, you know, who they are and, and what their priorities were. And, um, you know, I was not willing to allow them. Now I will take breaks and you know, we started the show talking about the hiatus you know, I'll take social media breaks and, and, and other breaks because I think it's good to get away and to recharge your batteries. And, you know, as we talked about on our last show, doing a podcast, doing a radio show, doing any kind of um, multimedia, you know, I do some um, some YouTube work as well, some, some Google Hangouts. So they're very time consuming. Even though you love doing it and, and it's important, you know, for, for us to have an outlet and, and a venue to express our opinions, even though you enjoy it, it is such a grind. And it's good to get away and to recharge and to um kind of recover, you know, a little bit from from that kind of uh, of grind, but it's good to be back and it's good to be talking about these things again. But yeah, you know, I used to get stick to sports Sharona, and you know, and I knew that even though you know that you're going to, you know, it's still it it's still very draining to you know to have to deal with that. And this is kind of part and parcel of the theme that um, you know that I've been talking about how we interact with one another. You know, the things that we do to, you know, when someone disagrees with you, how you handle that says everything about you. And when you express hate and, um, you know, similar type emotions towards someone that you disagree with, you're part of the problem. (laughs) You are, I mean, you are the problem. And that's um, kind of how we've ended up. I think we're you know, where we are, um, in, in our, uh, country, in, in, in our world, you know, across, across the board. So, uh, stick to sports that, you know, listen, if you want to just stick to sports, that's fine. You know, that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but don't not the people who, for them, you know, it's important to to talk about these other things. It's important to to weigh in on social is, issues. It's important to um, you know, to have a voice to to talk about some of the larger issues in in our society and in in our world. Um, it is interesting to get Carlos's thoughts on on the NBA. Uh, Derek Rose, can he stay healthy? I don't know. The Kevin Durant thing was so funny to me because, and I didn't get a chance to ask him about the Celtics. Hopefully he'll come back and, and I can get his, his thoughts on that. Um, it was so many people calling Kevin Durant soft for, um, you know, for leaving the Thunder and going to a team that's already stacked, that's loaded, you know, that um, is positioned, you know, possibly to win a, a championship. When, they do the same thing, you know. I mean, winning is is the goal, right? Everybody wants to win, and um, I certainly can't knock Kevin Durant for for that decision. I 
Ashley, I like the I love the decision. I thought he made uh, the best decision for him. The Dwayne Wade thing was a little bit more interesting to me because, uh, you know, I don't feel like he's going there. I, I guess he went there to get his money, and that's fine. You know, I mean, uh, Dwayne Wade is on the downside of his career. This is his last opportunity probably to cash in on free agency. I can't knock that, too, um, if that's, you know, what's important to to him. Sure, yeah, why not? And I think he wanted to make a uh, a statement to the Miami Heat who you know, weren't going to offer him the money, you know, that, that he wanted. And sure, why not? So, um, so yeah, we'll see, see how that um, works out for him. And uh, the Memphis Grizzlies with the moves that, you know, that they've made. You know, the Titans are in an interesting situation. Um, I, I'm rather curious to see what happens with them, with them this season. On our Wednesday night show, Going for Two, with Zach and Shrona, we had Sigmund Bloom, who I adore. He's a great football mind, great great fantasy football guy from the football guys. He, he doesn't like what's going on with the Titans and is – I'm going to avoid their offense. I probably like it a little bit more than that. Definitely like it a little bit more uh, than him. They're going to be a run first team. No question whatsoever about that. But I think that they're going to have a better offense this year than they had under Ken Wisenhunt. I like um, the, the draft moves that they made, shoring up the trenches and, and, and whatnot. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, the wide receiver position probably is the the most concerning of all because they've had, they've got some guys who still yet to prove themselves. I I like some of the moves that they've made. They've got some solid veterans there. And, of course, Delaney Walker is going to be awesome, is awesome, is going to continue to be awesome. So, you know, they, they definitely have that. Uh, but we'll see how their season, you know, does transpire. Um, they haven't won very much over the course of the last few seasons, so um, kind of hard to to be any worse, right? Uh, so um, really hoping that that they do, um, you know, win more games than than they have in the past. AFC South is is um, you know still uh, a, a down division. Probably the worst division in the National Football League right now. Um, the Colts, you know, they made some some interesting moves. The Jags uh, should be a, a, an improved team this year. Big year for Gus Bradley there. You know, the Texans with some of the moves that they've made. Um, we'll see how that Brock Osweiler signing uh, helps them. Whether it does help them, you know, they had to do something at quarterback. So it'll kind of interesting. Interesting times in the AFC South. We'll see how how that goes. Um, let's finish out the the show with um, you know with with some some lighthearted talk. We'll talk a little bit of gaming. We probably won't go. We have ten minutes left. Maybe we can talk gaming for about ten minutes. Hey, by the way, if you've got some some ideas for show topics, anything you want Sharona to talk about, anything you want me to address. Let me know. I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain your suggestions. You can follow me out there on Twitter at Sports by Sharona. Send me your suggestions. Send me your thoughts. I enjoy uh, interacting with, with people on social media as long as it's, you know, respectful and um, you're not, you know, um, coming into my mentions, calling me, you know, a B word or or whatever, then I'm happy to you know to have that interaction with you. But let me know what's on your mind. Let me know what you'd like to hear me talk about. If you got any ideas for uh, guests that you'd like to have me you know try to get on and 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 chat with, send them to me. Give me your thoughts on that. But gaming, you guys know I love gaming. Gaming is a big um, thing for me, and with you know Game of Thrones going on hiatus and. We're um, going to have to wait a pretty good while until it comes back. Uh, in my spare time, I've been playing um, this uh, online game. I'm a big Elder Scrolls fan. The Elder Scrolls um, is uh, a gaming 
is a gaming series that um, has been in existence for a long, long time. And I came into the Elder Scrolls environment from roughly around, I don't remember, when this game came out, I think in 2002. I'm going to look it up real quick from the Morrowind days, and that was a game, originally it was a PC-only game. You you played it on your computer, but Morrowind was the first game to make it, was first test, Elder Scrolls game, to make it to, yes, 2002, to make it to the console, and that was on the original Xbox, and I started playing it and loved it, and to me, it's still, uh, of the single-player games that um, was no Bethesda. It wasn't a Bethesda game. They bought out the the company that originally uh, produced it. But, um, it's still the, the best of that gaming series. Morrowind really changed the game in terms of RPGs and it was so open-ended and it had its issues. It was so glitchy. It was glitchy as all get out. And you really had to massage it and uh, you had to know how to to work around some of the the glitchy stuff, but I still go back and play it. It's it's still a fun game to play. Now with the advent of the latest gen consoles, Xbox One is the one that I play on. The difference is far more far more noticeable uh, than it was. You know, they made it backward compatible. You could play it on the 360. Um, and it wasn't as, it still survived, you know, that transition. Uh, I doubt that they'll make it, well, I don't know, who knows, we'll see, you know, whether they'll ever offer it on, on the one, probably not. But um, it's it's a game that was, at the time, was just so revolutionary, and it was so fun and so open-ended. Uh, so I got, you know, it, hooked on it, and then I played Oblivion. As well, that was the fourth test. Uh, Morrowind was the third in the series, and then Oblivion was the fourth, and Skyrim was the fifth. And now they've got this online game, The Elder Scrolls Online, that I've been playing. And I've been thinking about, you know, as as I've been playing it for the past several months, I've been thinking about. So I'm writing something right now that's really long and deep and and involved. I'm kind of thinking about maybe doing an article on like the top 10 things that people do in multiplayer games that irritate um, players who are trying to solo the game. So, you know, something like that, because it has been kind of irritating to deal with some of the, the things that, that other gamers do. But, um, but back to the series, we'll get into the, the online game, back to the series. Oblivion was from, a a graphic standpoint oblivion was really a beautiful game and um the storyline was 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 very good storyline and moral win was um was too and i think the storyline in oblivion was a little bit better than the storyline in you know maybe in moral win although uh they're pretty close the now the big boss battle at the end of moral win it's just still funny to me uh, because of the the way the guy looked and and the name and, and all of that. But it's a great game, and I still enjoy playing it. But Oblivion was just a beautiful game. I didn't enjoy Skyrim nearly as much as I enjoyed Morrowind and Oblivion. I know a lot of people do like it, but for me, in terms of the, the console games, it was probably my least favorite. There were aspects of it that I really liked a lot. I thought that the um, the <clears throat> you know the attack modes and uh, the the battles and and that so probably a little bit uh, improved over what you know, what they had been doing in the past. But still, from a storyline standpoint, I really really was disappointed in Skyrim. I did not think that the storyline was, um, was very good at all. Now, it, I mean, it was in, in its own way, it was a beautiful game, you know, with, um, with the, you know, the graphics and with Skyrim being kind of the, 
the Nord, uh, the snowy, you know, country, so to speak. And uh, it definitely has some things that, um, that are good about it, but still, you know, just in overall, in terms of the, the series, it, it's probably my least favorite. But, um, so I, you know, because I was disappointed in Skyrim, I didn't really put off playing the Elder Scrolls online. I wasn't sure whether I was going to enjoy it. I enjoy it far more than, um, than I expected. One of the things, one of the complaints that I had about Skyrim, you know, was that you didn't have, um, voice acting. The, the main protagonist didn't have voice acting. And then, when I found out that they didn't have it in the online version, I was like, well, you know, so, but it makes more sense to me not to have it on, on the online version because it is multiplayer and you can um, interact with, you know, with other players. But for, for me, and I'm not a big MMO player anyway, but I'm playing this game and I'm soloing it and, uh, it's kind of interesting to see the the interaction there, and I'm not the only one by any means who 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 solos these games. But there are the 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 interaction and the the challenge between playing with other players who are playing in groups and you know playing the the multiplayer aspect of it versus the ones, and you can tell sort of. I mean, I can because I'm familiar with it. I don't know that all players in there can. I think there's that's one of the things that I think is um, is interesting about it is that some of the MMO players don't seem to understand that. You know, don't seem to understand that there are uh, players in there who are tr- or who solo um, these games. But still, it you know, that that kind of interaction is is pretty interesting to me. And there's some, some, uh, interesting interaction with, um, you know, with, I've been involved with it myself and watched other players be involved with it. Rather interesting. Inter- but I've been thinking about doing an article like that. Let me know if you think that might be kind of a fun thing to do. I think, um, you know, knowing what, what irritates other gamers can can help improve you know your your gaming experience but i do enjoy the game it's it's really very interesting the one of the more interesting things about it to me is that uh being a big fan of morrowind and and having that um you know that attachment to that game you know you can uh, choose whatever faction you want to be associated with, and you can kind of have that Morrowind experience, and that's kind of cool and kind of and, and kind of fun. So I am, I'm enjoying it. Um, I have not really played much of the the downloaded con- content yet. A little bit. Um, they just introduced the the Dark Brotherhood. That's something that I've got to. To, to to try out. I've sort of started the Thieves Guild. I haven't really done it. I haven't gone to Cyrodiil and and done all of that. And I I have, can't really figure out how to do the Imperial City DLC without going you know through the the battle campaigns. But um, yeah, it's 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 been a really good experience. I'm I'm enjoying it. So maybe we'll we'll have to talk some gaming. Maybe we can get Owen Good from Polygon to come on and, and chat with us. He's kind of our gaming expert. So I'm enjoying it, and um, we'll have to talk some more about gaming. But that's it for today. Happy Friday, by the way. Uh, you've been listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. We will be back next week. Again, we're going to a one-show-per-week format. So we'll be back next week, maybe on Wednesday. We'll see how things go. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. Follow me once again on Twitter out there, Sports by Sharona. And um, try to be loving as much as possible toward one another. Uh, We're as much responsible for the things going on in this country as anyone else. Let's try to bring as much peace as we possibly can. And we will talk next week.